This Week in Startups is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Save time and money no matter what you ship or mail. Try it free for 30 days and get a free 10-pound scale when you visit pb.com slash twist. Segment. Segment Startup Program has exclusive deals with the best tools and resources to become a data expert. To see if you qualify for a free account worth up to $25,000, go to segment.com slash twist. And Pendo, a product cloud that helps digital product teams understand and guide their users, enabling them to build software experiences customers love. Visit pendo.io slash twist for two months of Pendo free. Quick introduction. Who am I? What do I do? Um, I'm SVP of Growth and Innovation at House Call Pro. We are a SaaS-enabled marketplace. We help unlock the potential in every single home service professional in the US. So we build a tool that does invoicing, scheduling, dispatching, online booking, marketing, a full suite of tools for a plumber, or for a carpet cleaner, or for a lawn care guy. Uh, that's what we build. Uh, by myself, I, I do do some angel work, um, Lightman Labs. Um, in the past, uh, I used to be at Qualcomm, where me and my founding team, actually now at House Call Pro, we founded Qualcomm Labs. So we took a whole bunch of uh, Qualcomm's corporate R&D money and built products out of it. And that was really fun. We had a successful product called Gimbal. And then previous to that, I used to be a scuba dive master. I hung out in Cabo San Lucas. Uh, early on in my career, I made a lot of money playing poker. So you see some mentions of poker throughout my presentation here, especially around EV. Uh, bought a yacht, decided to become a scuba dive master. And then after that, I uh, decided to go get the big boy job at Qualcomm. Found my co-founders, went to House Call Pro. So fun story, but that's who I am. Uh, feel free to connect with me afterwards or if you guys have questions and things. So I'm going to share my secret with you guys. Probably a lot of the presentations, people are like, here, this is exactly what you need to do. Um, I'm going to tell you here there is no silver bullet. And a lot of startups think there's going to be one way uh, to go to market. And what I'm about to tell you is don't go that way. Uh, go for more lead bullets. So I'm going to have some analogies in here. So hopefully it makes sense. And you'll see a little asterisk down here in the bottom left hand corner, which means maybe not quite yet because there is a way to get to a silver bullet. But you got to do some other things first. So let's talk about it. Um, essentially, before we go hunting uh, for bullets right, or channels uh, as we go to market, you need to first think, OK, for the product that I have right now, what are the three things? So the first thing is, um, is the customer ready for this? OK, so do they have a pain that needs to be solved? The second thing is, are they willing? So is the pain large enough that they're willing to pay for it? Because someone might say they have a problem, but they might not be willing to pay for it. So make sure they're willing to pay for it. And the third thing is, is are they able to? So are they in a financial position, uh, but also in a political position? Right? So are you talking to the right person so that if they want to pull the trigger, they have the budget to do so? Um, obviously, I'm coming from a B2B angle. Uh, I'm selling VSMB, right? uh, one to 10 truck operators. Uh, but if you're going up to enterprise, make sure you're talking to the people that actually either go write the check or report directly to the person that will write the check because you need your champion. But make sure that they can do it because otherwise, you're wasting your time. So make sure before you start building any channels that your customers fit these three things. So when they fit these two things, I'm gonna to talk to you about a, kind of a, a framework that I think about, but what are the components of a bullet or what are the components of a channel? So the way that I think about it constantly is just there's three variables. The first one that I think about is what's the cost? So I think of all my channels and possibility of channels that I expand into is like, what is the cost of the channel? And I think of it as on a per unit basis or per customer basis. So when you're evaluating channels uh, to one another, you wanna make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So you're not just saying, hey, there's a, a like, this is the lead cost, or this is the demo cost, or this is the uh, customer cost. And then you're evaluating them against each other. You have to all take it down to the lowest common denominator. So the variable I always think about is C. And then from a difficulty perspective, I think, how easy is it for me to do? Or is it for the company to do? So for someone that specializes in, uh, who, who here is good at like writing content? Content? No. Who here is good at making cold calls? OK. Who's good at writing emails? Stalking people on LinkedIn. OK. So each of you guys, you maybe have uh, things that you're better at than others. And so every single time you run through this framework, you might end up with two different types of answers if you were to ask these of different people. So always think about what's the difficulty, but the measure of it is time. Because if you're really good at BD, it might take six months before you can get a deal or a partnership. 
put into place to actually have a channel start to produce some value for you guys. Um, the last one is quantity. So you might find some really easy, quick wins, but they can only yield you maybe 10 customers, 20 customers, 1,000 customers, whatever it is. Um, and so when you take all of these into account, make sure you're working on things as you multiply them through that is actually going to matter. Um, just because a channel has low uh, amounts of quantity, so low potential amount of customers, that's not necessarily bad if it's really easy and it's not difficult. So rather than tell you guys a bunch of tactics and growth tactics that only work for a small period of time, um, this is the framework that I use. And the framework is very simple. So when you're first starting out, everything is very subjective. <laughs> Um, and as you mature as a company, it becomes more objective as you start to figure out what the channels are and what the true cost of things are. And the beginning is subjective. But what you want to do is you want to take a channel, take a bullet, and then measure it on the, each axis. So the C, the D, and the Q. So for the cost axis, you would rate it somewhere between 1 to 10. 1 being it's very cheap, or uh, uh, 1 being it's very uh, expensive, one, uh, 10 being it's really cheap. Uh, the difficulty you do it the opposite way as well. So if it's really difficult, you wanna rate it a one. If it's very easy to do, it takes less time, it's a 10. And then in terms from quantity, so how many customers can you get from it, put that on a spectrum as well. And so when you end up with these three different variables, you're gonna find a way to get some bullets. So what are the types of different channels? we might have here. Um, these are just some, I just threw them up. Any of you guys can look through them. But as you're kind of doing your research on what kind of channels you wanna start to attack, especially as a young company, start to figure out uh, where maybe you have some expertise in. Um, but there's a lot of different ones out here. So what you wanna do when you're evaluating the channels and the bullets that you're gonna go after is you wanna list all the different ideas that you have. Just create a list, put it in Google Docs. I'm gonna show you a, a, my Google Docs here in a second. Um, but create that list and have those three vectors, the C, the D, the Q vector. Um, and what you're gonna find out is when you multiply them all together, you're gonna get the expected value from a channel. And now you're gonna have a base metric to evaluate some things before others. Uh, the fun thing of starting a company, I remember uh, almost four and a half years ago, is like, there's so much blue ocean. There's so many channels you haven't tested. There's so many fun things you can do, but because you have a lot, you don't know where to focus your energy on and you're going to end up turning into the person that's like, oh, squirrel, oh, squirrel, squirrel. And you're going to be jumping around all over the place. So this will hopefully gives you kind of that framework for deciding where you're going to go spend that energy, but doing it in a more methodical way. Because when you're a young company, you only have so much time, time before you either run out of money or your spouse tells you to go get a real job. So what do you get? So this is a C, the D, the Q, okay? So you're multiplying these together. So this is an example of how you'd wanna lay something like this out. You can add more columns. This is really easy to create in Google Sheets. But essentially, you wanna have someone, uh, so essentially the bullet, that's a channel. That's the, that's the type of thing you want to do. Um, it fits within those different channels that I had uh, on the slide earlier. Um, you also want to just put a date. You want to put someone who either owns the idea or came up with it. Uh, write a description, so sort of like a user story as it relates to uh, maybe an engineer. So if someone is reading it, they could understand what it is. Um, and then you can see those three columns there, the cost, the difficulty, and the quantity. And then you've got this fancy, cool feature where you can color code it in Google Sheets, and then you can sort it this way. So what do you think you wanna focus on first? <laughs> it's the thing on the top, it's the thing that has the most value. So um, this is what we use, especially in the early days, and, and now it's a little less, um a little less formal because we have less things that we're working on uh, when it comes to channel exploration. Um, but what in the beginning, this allows you to focus on, okay, we're doing the first one, then the second one, then the third and the fourth. And you can have a constant idea bucket. Uh, in the early days, we would do a lot of just brainstorming on whiteboards, put up sticky notes and just have all kinds of channel ideas, throw all in the sheet and everyone throws numbers on what is the cost, the difficulty, and the quantity. Because you might have somebody that uh, on your team that's really good at writing content, uh, and you might suck at it. <laughs> okay, So if that person is really good at writing content, you want them to throw a number on that, and you discuss, well, why is your number that you threw so high or so low? And so as a team, you come into an aggregate function of what is the best thing to focus your time on. If you're running a business and you're listening to This Week in Startups, I know you are, you know that time is money and shipping can be complex and time consuming because the rates are constantly changing. Well, Send Pro Online by Pitney Bowes is a solution that will help you scale. Whether you're sending letters, packages, overnights, or even flats, you can easily compare the cost of the USPS, UPS, and FedEx in an all-in-one tool. 
You then print the shipping labels and stamps right from your own printer, no extra hardware. And you can track those shipments and get email notifications when they arrive. Ever since the U.S. Postal Service rates increased in January, you are still able to access savings of up to 40% off USPS priority mail shipping and five cents off every letter you send just by using Send Pro Online. That's right, Send Pro Online by Pitney Bowes. Pitney Bowes, as you know, has been around for a hundred years. It's one of the original Fortune 500 companies, and they now are at the forefront of providing shipping solutions. I know this because so many of you asked me to sign a book for you, and I signed that book and I send it out, and we use Send Pro Online. It's only $14.99 a month, and listeners can get a free 30-day trial at pb.com slash twist pb.com slash twist a two-letter domain name pretty cool also you'll receive a 10 pound scale to help you weigh those packages accurately so you're not wasting money you can calculate your shipping costs and never overpay that's pb.com slash twist please use that slash twist so they know we sent you and experience the convenience of send pro online for yourself when you sign up for that 30-day trial. Thank you so much to Pitney Bowes for creating Send Pro Online. It really is an elegant and beautiful solution. We use it all the time. Thanks again. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. So in the early days, what's fun is in order to get 20% month-over-month growth or 10% week-over-week, it's really easy. You don't need a lot of customers to do that growth. It gets harder when you get to Series C and you're trying to literally do as much business as you do this month as you did your entire life before, right? Because you're really hitting that hockey stick. Uh, so in the early days, think about uh, what is the nominal amount of customers that you need to acquire to get to that next milestone. Uh, so this is, I'm just saying like 100 just for, for uh for an example, but uh, if you're selling enterprise, you might only need three customers, right? If you're selling uh, something more consumer centric, you might need thousands or tens of thousands. Um, but people typically tend to overestimate what they can accomplish in a small amount of time and underestimate what they can do in a long amount of time. Um, and so breaking it down in this way, it really causes you to focus on a week to week basis as a startup, how many new customers you need to get. So when you're applying these channels, you're testing them, take your end goal, which is let's say 100 customers before you go pitch your series seed or before you hit your next milestone and divide that by the amount of weeks. So you can really have your eye on the mark when you're thinking about how many customers per week do I need to get? Because what will invariably happen if you say, well, we need 100 three months from now, guess what? You're gonna be stuck at like 20 at like day 80. <laughs> and you have 10 days left to go figure out all the other customers you need to go achieve. So if you break this down and you put this on the wall, you can actually measure measure against it. So I'm going to tell you guys some of my early hunting strategies uh, with these with these bullets. Um, but in the early day, you really want to figure out you got into this business, whatever company you're building, because you have some domain expertise. I don't know what it is, but you've got some piece of knowledge that you know that hopefully nobody else knows, or maybe someone knows but doesn't know how to execute or is willing to execute on it. So in the early days, focus on what you're really good at and take that channel because what you'll find when you throw all those channel ideas up there is because you're good at it, that score for the difficulty is gonna rank really high and it's gonna skew those metrics to what you're gonna focus on uh, as the number one thing you need to focus on. So in the early days, you don't need that much to get to your 100 customers or your 10 customers, but leverage whatever that domain expertise that is. So because you have a lot of uh, low hanging fruit, um, rather than take that one thing you're really good at and continuing to scale that channel. So going deeper into that channel, sometimes I like to think of it as like mines, right? The gold in the first part of the mine is really easy to hit, but then you gotta like dig deeper and dig deeper to get more of the gold. Rather than going really deep, start another one, right? Create a new channel because there's so many channels when you're a young company that you haven't hit. Um, the marginal difficulty increases the further you get. Okay, so what you wanna do is you wanna go wider before you go deeper. So in the early stage, don't go too deep. I, I talked to a lot of founders that are like, I found this one channel and I'm really good at content SEO and all they do is they keep banging their head on their like, article, 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 and they go article, article. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You need to go look at some other channels because just because you're good at it, don't get stuck in it, so go wider. Um, once you start maturing a little bit, those original channels that you had some success on, now is a good time and hopefully you've raised some money or you've gotten some sort of um, you know, friends, family, or fools money that you can throw at this thing. Um, so you can start doubling or tripling down on some of those channels. So now that hopefully you've got three or four or five of them, um, start doubling down before you start going too wide because otherwise you're gonna fall prone to squirrel syndrome and that is just, that's another way to uh, die slowly. 
So this is where, hey, look, my little emoji didn't translate to PDF. That was funny. On my Google Slides, I was able to put the emoji, but then I, I made it PDF and it made that little like wah-wah. Okay, but um, essentially for the longer hunting strategies, uh, now what we do is we're constantly looking for new channels, uh, but rather than spending all of our resources on just developing more lead bullets, uh, we actually develop, wow, I'd say about 10 to 20% of our marketing resources go to find a channel that can really be that long shot, that silver bullet. Um, in the early days, if you're trying to find that one channel that will take you to a billion dollar company, you're gonna fail 100% of the time, unless you get really, really lucky. Um, now that you have resources, hopefully, and you're in the longer part of the game, you can actually start to put some resources towards finding some experimental channels that maybe are really difficult, right? So they would rate really low on the quantity, uh, and the cost might be really expensive, right? But you might have a really deep channel, right? And traditionally, you wouldn't go for those. Remember the red ones on the sheet I showed you earlier? So normally, you wouldn't go for those because you got plenty of green and yellow ones right there at the top. Um, we'll get to questions later, but yes. <laughs> uh, but make sure as you're allocating uh, your resources, you're not over allocating into finding the silver bullet because you will die before you find it, okay? So stay alive. So everyone goes, well, Roland, what about LTV to CAC and all these acronyms and things I'm learning about? And like, how, like shouldn't you be using that as a model for finding your channels? Um, I say no. So in the early days, payback matters in everything. Um, so people will say, well, you need the best unit economics. You need LTV to CAC to be this ratio. Um, payback means the most. And what payback means is how long does it take you to make your money back on the customer that you acquired? So our goal was always to keep it a year or under. And that's pretty hard to do. Um, some businesses a little bit less, some businesses not. But when you're funding it out of your own pocket, you really want to know when you see that money back. Uh, VCs and angels, they have longer time horizons, right? They can place a bet, they can wait five years, they can wait 10 years, they can wait until that fund matures or not. Who cares, right? Because one out of 10 may work, or one out of 100. Um, but when you're younger, you wanna see how quickly can you get that money that you spent back in your pocket. Because as an angel myself, I look more at payback period than any kind of LTV to CAC. Because in the beginning, your LTV is based on your churn, and I guarantee you don't know what your real churn is because you haven't been long enough alive to experience what it means. So whatever number you throw up there, I know is BS, okay? So rather than lie about that number or just put a number up there and kind of look like a newbie founder, go back out there and say, hey, it costs me this much to acquire a guy, right? Or gal, whatever it is, and then I get it within five months, six months, whatever that is. So once you have the VC dollars, let's spend some of their money. So at this point is uh, we started taking more bets and more aggressive bets, but we were able to make them because we understood our unit economics, we understood what our churn rates were and we could extrapolate that out so we can start bidding and spending more money uh, at a faster, higher velocity. But don't make this bet with your own money. Use the, you're giving up percentage of your company to go make bets with someone else's money. So do it then, don't do it when it's your own. So hopefully if you listen to everything I said and you did everything right, <laughs> uh, you found a lot of different channels, you have some good unit economics, uh, more importantly, you have like a really good framework for testing uh, how to build out channels or to build more bullets. Um, you prioritize and, hang and leverage your low-hanging fruit, so the things that either you're good at or easy channels that you can go grab. Um, and the last thing is, maybe you found a silver bullet along the way, but you lived long enough to go find it. So, I'm gonna show you guys like a little behind the scenes is from our investor decks, where you can see how this like channel development and the unit economics and those kind of came to play. Um, some things I just throw on there, some things are a little more blurred, um, but uh, you can always ask me privately, I'm happy to tell you all of the things that you see. So Series Seed, um, this is actually cool. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story about this guy. Uh, in the early days, we started using stock photography of, of handymen and things like that. There were models that looked like really good. All they did was they put on like a tool belt uh, and they shot some pictures. Uh, our customer base saw that and they're like, yeah, they don't, they're not in touch with our customers. So now we go out, uh, we pull the Airbnb, we follow our pros around, we take lots of pictures of them. And this is one of the guys here in San Diego. Um, that's where, where our company is. Uh, you'll see some stock photos through, through here. But it actually helped us a lot in our pitching uh, when we went out and we talked to investors because... Uh, an investor wants to invest in somebody that's really close to their customers. So that's a little, little, little growth hack, a little tip. 
So in the early days, we started out as more of a consumer marketplace, uh, Uber for X, Uber for home services. So we would be, for example, directly competitive with someone like uh, like a Thumbtack or Homejoy, which never learned to tell the tale. Um, and so we needed to build both the consumer side and the pro side. So we tried channels on both sides. So in the early days, that's where we got to. Um, the unit economics for making that work is actually quite difficult. And along the way, you know, you hear people talk about pivots and those things, but really what we started to do is just focus more on the supply side of our marketplace, which is building a tool for the pros to use, for which there really is nothing out there uh, except for um, what we found to be us. Uh, but you can kind of see some ideas here of things that we tried in terms of channels. Um, we would buy iPhones and give them to pros as like an acquisition, like, hey, Handyman, if you want to work on my platform, I'll give you a free iPhone and I'll pay your bills. Right, that's that was one way that we got to our pros. Um, in the early days, on the consumers, um, what uh, what we would do is we would uh, take checks and just write uh, the let's say in San Diego we say um, uh, La Jolla Elementary School and we write five hundred dollars and we we just go we walk in, I'd walk in the office and I'd I'd hand it off to the lady and she's like well what's this for and I said well uh, the moms here at the school are using this cool app house call and a percentage of the proceeds they go straight back into uh, your your PTA organization. And they're like, wow, 500 bucks? How, well, how do we do more of this? I'm like, well, just get more of them use house call. So I found a really great way to get house call embedded in the entire schools there. Um, turns out, uh, just writing checks with, with money, after a while, they started to figure out that there weren't that many people actually using the house call app to give that kind of a royalty check. So someone didn't add up. Uh, they still took our money uh, or the VC money. Um, but it was one of our early ideas. So remember, as you're building channels, like no crazy ideas off the table. So uh, we raised a Series 2 seed. Um, so this is, these were our acquisition channels. So you see a little bit kind of what we're, what we're up to. Um, in the early days, uh, we put on our customer hat. We said, hey, if I was a carpet cleaner, where would I go to find out more about carpet cleaning? There happens to be a place called Truck Mount Forums. So if you haven't seen one of those trucks, they actually have a truck mount in there uh, that heats up the water really, really hot and sucks it. Right? So that's how carpet cleaners learn um, how to clean the carpets. They go to these forums. So one was Truck Mount Forums. And so very uh, early on to raise our Series 2 seed, <laughs> we had uh, what we'd put on our marketing spend, our sales spend, because we had an inside sales team, and how many pros we required, and we calculated the CAC. Uh, another channel we found out was automated voicemail, text, and email bombs. Um, so one thing we learned about plumbers is that the phone is the entryway to their business. They cannot not pick up the phone, because that's where they get the majority of the business from. So if you call them, guess what you're talking to? The owner, in most cases, and they have to pick up. They can't ignore you. Uh, they cannot not pick it up. Um, so that that was a, a method that we used in sending texts and then sequencing it with different emails saying like, hey, could you run your business in a better way? A pros grow on average 30% year over year if they use our software, right? So we create all these drip campaigns and things and, and that kind of worked out in the early days. Um, we found, uh, so this was a channel that was uh, not particularly deep, but uh, was quite cost effective in the early days, but we were able to buy leads online. So you'll see like the G2 crowds, the, the software advices, the, the Capteras, those things that we spent a little bit of money with. Um, we obviously spent a lot more than this now <laughs> on them, uh, but it worked. Uh, we, we tried some retargeting um, that came in at a, at a decent CAC, um, but was more brand awareness um, and then referrals. So once a plumber is using our software, hey, if I give you a hundred bucks, will you go get your buddy to use it? And I'll give him a hundred bucks. Yes. So we monetize on that, some marketing spend, we've got some pros. But in the early days, this is all that it took. Because remember, you're probably thinking like, Roland, that's only 90 customers. Well, that was enough for us to prove out and raise our Series 2 seed. Um, so remember when I told you like get the 100 customers in that time frame, that milestone, we knew what we needed to get to. And if we could prove that these were relatively scalable, um, especially some of these top ones here, uh, that we can go raise money against it. When you're building your startup, you have a ton of questions about your users and how they're using your product. Who are these people? How are they using it? And are you working on the right things? Many times I meet founders and they have 50 different features in their product and they don't know who's using what and when and how often. Well, that's what Segment helps you do. It helps you answer these critical questions so that you can put your dev resources, you can put your people, designers, et cetera, the management team, the sales team, you can get them all aligned by studying your user data and figuring out what to focus on. You can cut down on annoying integrations and just have your developers get back to work by using Segment. You just, boom, put it right into your product and it's easy to use. And they've recently launched a startup program. That's why they're here on This Week in Startups as a partner. And early stage startups can get access to a free segment account worth up to 
wait for it, 25 large, 25 dime skis, $25,000, complete with exclusive deals with the best tools for startups and resources to become a data expert. It's the ultimate analytics setup at a startup's favorite price. To see if you qualify for Segment's account worth up to 25000 large, check out segment.com slash twist. S-E-G-M-E-N-T dot com slash twist. I mean, they got the name segment.com. That's a really good domain name. Segment.com slash twist. Get that uh, application in and see if you're going to get that $25,000 worth of segment. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. So... We thought it'd be really cool to throw a funnel in our in our um, slide decks uh, for raising, um, and uh, and so you see kind of our marketing channels here, and so we literally put all we put all the data in here. So this is our inside sales model. So um, what was nice is it made it really clear. Okay, if I contact this many, then these many say, "Yep, I want it." Then you get this many on a demo. By the way, getting a plumber to join a join.me, they don't know what dot me is, so they're join.me dot what, and there are all kinds of fun things we ran into. But once you get them on the demo, are the ones that are good fit? 45% of them bought. Who knew, right? Um, so we showed this, this slide and this became repeatable. Um, and this allowed us to go raise some more money because this, this was a, um, uh, a quite a, um, you'll, you'll see here this, this metric holds up. So Series A, what was in that deck? <laughs> Let's talk more about channels. All right, so remember when I talked how deep they are? So now on this auto text voicemail thing that we built, well, we scraped a whole bunch of networking groups. Uh, CSLB has got a lot of pros on there, got a whole bunch of data from there. And now you can see how deep right, these channels are. Uh, the cost is free, minus the scraping part. Um, and <laughs> the difficulty is rather low. Right, so that became a channel. You can see the forums here. So I was like, hey, you know what? Yes, the, the carpet cleaners, they learn about truck mounts at truck mount forums. Um, there's another forum for carpet cleaners. And then guess what? Window cleaners, they go to this other board. Right? So now all of a sudden, we can now start to build out what, what, is, what do these channels look like? What's the depth of them? Um, and then here, for example, Wattsco. Uh, so they're a big uh, supplier. And obviously, if their pros do well, i.e. they run their business in a better way. They buy more things from them, and because they buy more things from them, they make more money, so they're incentivized to pitch our product to their pros. Uh, so that was another one, 100,000 deep. So once you start uh, going a little bit further, you know, the investor will say, well, how deep and how big are these channels? And if I give you a dollar, can you go put it to work right away? And our answer was yes, we can. Like We can't even reach all these people, and look how deep it is. So we showed them the same slide because they seem to love it on the Series 2 seed. <laughs> Now it's just a little bit more, <laughs> a little more leads, a little more demos. Our close rate dropped a little bit, and what was great was we said, you know, of these demos, 823 were a good fit, and for the ones that weren't a good fit, we just said we were feature incomplete. They didn't say no, just not yet. So that same slide seemed to resonate with them. When I talked to you guys a little bit about payback, uh, this was a good representation of it. Obviously, most investors will understand it, but from here, you can kind of see, you know, I spend $295 up front, and then our software platform for the pro side is SaaS, right? So over time, I get my dollars back until, ding, 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 you get paid back. And what investors love to see more than anything is that that payback period is A, under the 12 months, but then B, it's decreasing. So you can see here on the top that we showed, hey, in Feb, it was almost a year to get paid back. And now it's 8.3 months, and now it's 8.2, and 7.1. Because what investors will think in their head is like, holy crap. I gotta give these guys some money because we gotta push this payback period back to here to make them more aggressive, to make them grow. So if you can show that decreasing payback period, that's a very powerful tool. So Series B came along. This guy, Bradbury Garage Doors, John, he loves his tool. You can see, he's really happy with it. Investors love these slides, I'm telling you. If there's anything you learn from today for this whole presentation, add pictures of your customers and legit pictures. Do not use stock photography. Go out and go take pictures. If you don't know how, go hire somebody. It's totally worth it. So um, by that time, we spent some of our Series A money and we hired a, a designer on the marketing team. So you can see the slides look a little fancier, a little nicer, right? The investors love a little nicer too. Okay, so you know we showed the pro truck, all pro, all leads lead to the pro truck, and kind of the different types of channels uh, that we had developed over the time uh, to get to where we're at. Obviously, our suppliers, where there's exclusives, consumer booking. So if you actually go to Yelp uh, right now and you look for a carpet cleaner, you see an online booking one. We power all that for Yelp. Uh, obviously, pros want that feature, uh, so it's a good selling tool for us. 
Um, and then these are the listing sites. So now by this time we had, we're on all four of those. So if you Google house call pro reviews or field service management, you'll see we're crushing everybody there. Um, outbound sales, obviously is still a good part of our, our channels, right? That's really deep. We keep reinvesting. Um, and then a freemium play. So how can we uh, offer our parts of our app for free to then drive more acquisition? Um, this was a fancy looking slide here. Obviously, we were able to show them we had low churn, high LTV, and fast payback. Those are the three things that we focused on. We had it all in here. They loved that one. And if you want to know them, I'll tell you later. Um, and then look, the funnel, same thing. It just looks a little fancier, <laughs> minus some of the numbers because we had numbers on like an appendix deck at this point. Uh, but it just showed, hey, we have built out all these channels, all these bullets here, and these percentages uh, increased, which is great, right? Because we're getting better product market fit when we're selling. So Series C came along. So we decided to take more pictures of pros. Does he look like an angel? He's the kind of pro you want to have show up at your house. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we're really showing, hey, what's the TAM? You know, we think there's 3 million of our customers that are out there, and then we broke it down by vertical, and then we put this all together. We got data from all kinds of places, and what is the firm size? So lots of small guys, you guys see that? That's where we target. We target the 1 to 20. And so for that, that's most of the colors that matter. And then we showed, this is where our leads are come from. So when your question came up, well, what's your silver bullet? The answer is there is none yet, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a compilation of all the different channels that we built up over time. They each increase in depth. Um, and over time, we'll keep generating more and more channels. Uh, but as you mature as a company, there's less and less of them. right? So in the early days, when I say go for the low-hanging fruit, do it, because there's so many opportunities. Uh, but then even now, you can see back here, um, they're all pretty much the same uh, over time, just, just bigger. And these are enrollments month over month, where they come from. Um, and then you got to get really nerdy. So by Series C, we were able to hire a data analyst that could sit there and just crunch numbers and play in Excel all day. So uh, you can see all the different types of uh, channels that we have. Uh, there's way more. Like this spans like way over that way. Uh, but essentially, you can see we're measuring their lit rate. So that's uh, after their free trial, do they stay or do they go? Uh, it's the inverse of free trial. Uh, then their churn rate. Uh, what's their life? So how long are they going to stay with us? Right, Because those are directly correlated. You calculate them. And then our ASP, which is a combination of their SaaS fees and their credit cards. How much money do we make? And now, you know, investors, they really want to see what are the unit economics. By the time they write you a big check, you better have figured this out. <laughs> so we did. Um, but you can see here uh, exactly how it breaks down. We blended everything together. We had payback and depth and confidence. So the things that I told you guys earlier, right, the framework, helps power these learnings throughout the entirety of uh, your, your startup. And they never go away. They only just become more. And hopefully you've got someone you can hire to go run these numbers for you. Red is bad. Green is good, by the way. All right. A lot of times, too, as your company grows, uh, VCs will say, well, you can't keep spending money at that. It's just going to increase in cost over time. So a big thing that we showed was like, no, they pretty much stay the same. Right? The more money you give us, it's not going to increase the cost. We can keep going on more of them. Why is it? Because we have sub 1% of the market. No one has more than that uh, where we're at. Right? There's 3 million customers. So it'll stay this way for a long time. But when you mix this CAC that stays the same and the ASP, right, the average selling price, you can see this payback. Here's a payback slide. Just looks a little fancier, guys. Same thing. Okay. You can see over time, here we go, payback goes up. And slowly, by the way, lines of best fit are like man's best friend. Because <laughs> you just throw that in there. Uh, hopefully it's going down or up, whichever case it may be. Um, but it really shows the trend when stuff is a little choppy, because it will be as a startup. It definitely will be. But you can see it's decreasing over time. So all of a sudden now it's like, hey, 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 it's going too low here, right? And it says 10 or 12, by the way. It's blurred, but you can kind of see it, right? You guys are probably thinking like Roland probably doesn't know. I do know. <laughs> but technically it's blurred. All right, so, oh my gosh, it's 10 to 12 months again. Let's like give you guys some more money. Let's bring that back up to that year mark or more, right? Because we can be more aggressive. So hopefully you guys learned a little bit about something. It's kind of scaling it from the start kind of to the end here. If you guys have questions, I'm going to take questions now. But if you guys want to reach out to me personally, um, I'll just keep my info up here as you guys ask questions. Do you build or manage a SaaS product software as a service? Well, Pendo is built for product managers and customer success teams to understand and guide their users. It's very simple. You install one line of code, just one little zip, zip, zip into your app. 
uh, or into your website and it auto collects every user action and it rolls them into a rich, elegant set of analytics. Why is this important? Well, if you collect all this feedback, you can understand what your customers are doing and what they're not doing in your app and where to focus your resources. And you can find out where they're frustrated and what's making them bounce and leave your product, maybe give you a bad review even, or you can find out, hey, what's delightful and where do they spend their time and how to double down on that feature. And you can do this really easy with Pendo. 850 plus software organizations from Marketo to Instant Cart, which I love, OpenTable, which I love, Zendesk, which I love. They're all using it, including two of my portfolio companies, at least, actually three I can now, 15.5, Lead Genius, and Sprinkler, all are using Pendo. It's great for onboarding users and converting trials to paid plans with walkthroughs, tool tips, and other in-app communications. That's how Sprinkler uses it. And it's great to guide legacy customers to adapt new digital platforms, reducing uh, support tickets and improving your N and net promoter score, NPS. And the best part, no engineering resources are needed to do this. Investment in Pendo has paid off for Sprinkler in just three to six months. So visit pendo.io slash twist, P-E-N-D-O dot I-O slash twist, and you'll get two months, not one, two of Pendo free. What a deal. Thanks to the team at pendo.io slash twist for doing that. Also, Pendo's product craft community is producing a great event for product teams May 9th at the Palace of Fine Arts. Learn more and snag a discount code at pendo.io slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Um, I was curious if you could elaborate more on your forum acquisition. Um, like, how did that how did that work? Sure. So, there's two types of forum acquisitions. One is there's people that are old that run the forums, and so they want to get paid like a fixed amount for either a fixed amount of impressions or just to have your ad up. Period. Uh, and you got to measure the conversions. In the early days, I wanted to keep the cost low. So, in order to keep the cost low, all my deals are structured on RevShare. So I told someone like, hey, if somebody signs up, I'm not going to pay you for the ad. I'm not going to pay you to list it. But if someone pays, right, ends up becoming my customer, I'm going to pay you a rev share or percentage uh, in perpetuity. We don't do that anymore. But in the early days, that's how I got some deals done. Um, and so going after the forums, you got to figure out like who are the owners, uh, and not just who are the owners, but who makes money from it. And then once you learn who that is, reach out to them and put a deal together. Because um, forums... I would say four years ago was bigger. Now Facebook groups are pretty big. So Facebook groups is no different. So um, you can imagine there's like a bazillion home service Facebook groups. Uh, but you can figure out who are the admins of those uh, and then who's really like who owns it. Um, and you can buy your right to to shill. Like in, in the home services space, it's called shilling. But it's, called, it's just like you can just pitch your product inside of there uh, without getting banned or getting blocked or booted. Yeah, that was going to be my question. I know sometimes, um, you know, you try and like Reddit, for example, you'll try and go on there and just like do a quick plug and it's like banned immediately so <laughs> reddit's pretty aggro yeah so when you're in there the people in reddit are they'll flag it like real freaking quick so yeah if you're not doing it the right way and you you have to be pretty tricky in how you design your content if you're pushing it to reddit uh to make it read way more informative um i would say reddit i'll use it more as a channel to develop more of a brand uh, awareness and customer advocacy rather than trying to direct sell through it um there's other forums where you can literally like take over and you do whatever you want and post whenever you want those ones use it more as a, like a direct sales method a quick question about how you connect your marketing strategy with the product development because sometimes you think oh okay if we change the sign up or add a certain feature during the sign up it could you know uh, drive our our channels better and and do you have a system of doing that? Because sometimes that could be costly, but also worth it because the channel is working better. Yeah. Sure. So my biggest advice here when you're younger is just feature fake the hell out of everything. Okay. So even today, if you go to housecallpro.com for slash tools, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff there. All those features are completely fake. They don't exist, but they have a sign up form. And the, the way that we test these kind of things is if a lot of pros sign up for this product, I'll go build it. I'll go peel off a couple engineers to go um, build that one product. Um, but in the early days, feature fake a lot of it. So rather than invest in that cost side of things, determine the demand by offering that and see how many people click it. And then when they click it, say, you know what, I'm sorry. It's not available yet, but it will be in the future, right? Or maybe not, or offering them some sort of discount. Um, but when you can see that, you can measure intent. And so that way you're not building stuff that maybe you can sell more. Because I promise you, so I led both the sales team and the marketing team and, and all the, the acquisition teams in, at one point in aligning sales and marketing. The salespeople always like, will always say, well, hey, you know what, product team, we need this feature because all the customers, they're not signing up because of this one reason, right? So the best thing to do is, 
put that feature in there, make it fake, and then see if that tune is still the same. Because if it is, right, then you know you need to build it. And if it's not, then the salespeople were just lying and they just couldn't close. Uh, the Hatchwack supplier uh, felt like a very unique channel when compared to the, all the other channels that you did. Are you trying to evaluate a new business model or trying to go into uh, being an app through the suppliers, resellers? What is the thinking behind that? Sure. So uh, my generic thoughts around how do you acquire customers is put yourself in the hat of the customer and then think about all the people you interact with a day-to-day -day basis. So I was like, okay, if I was an HVAC guy, like who are my friends? Well, what do I do? What does my day look like? And I, I literally create a daily log of my day in the life of an HVAC person. Then I would write down, I would think I wake up at five or I drive my truck. I go to the supply house. Oh wait, ding, ding, ding. There's my supplier. Right. And then I'm here and I'm listening to this podcast, right? Cause I'm driving. So I don't view things. I don't read things. I listen to things. So throughout the entire customer journey, I'm mapping out the touch points that uh, our customer, the pro has, uh, and trying to figure out how can I intersect or get in between that or leverage some part of that relationship. So, uh, talking about suppliers, the idea was just, okay, well, where do I pr my pros? spend a lot of time well every morning they go to home depot or they go to the plumbing supply house so if i make a partnership with them they probably see a lot of plumbers they probably have a lot of plumber customers and then i was like well it's probably good for them if their plumbers are running software because if they're the favorite supplier they're going to get more jobs and if they get more jobs they're going to buy more supplies so whenever i thought about bd partnerships i think a little bit about you know is it reciprocal on both ends so does that component work but then also i arrive at it by just putting on the customer hat and then just doing ride-alongs so I saw it's unrelated to the BD side, but you raised a, like a seed plus. And I'm curious, I don't know how much you can share, but we're looking at doing that right now. And it's kind of our stage. What was going on approximately inside the company and how did that relate to the investor narrative that in that second seed? Sure. So we laid off a bunch of people to get our burn next to zero again. So we went from, I think, like 16 down to 12, but 12 essential and five of those being founders. So I have four other founders, right? So dilution is real, okay? Um, but at the same time, we wouldn't have gotten to where we're at without that, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Eng, so they all code. Um, I just idea and hustle and growth and stuff. But at that time in the company, we uh, were like, you know what, this this marketplace is not really working. Um, uh, back in that day, uh, Homejoy just imploded, right? They were the YC darling. Yeah, poof, cratered. Uh, exec, uh, Justin uh, Khan, poof, right? They're all going down. It's like, oh, this marketplace is pretty high. Thumbtack's still doing good. Thumbtack's still good, doing good, right? They're do but they're doing like lead gen, uh, le less full, full, uh, full stack. Um, so at that point, we're like, hmm, let's build up the house called Pro App side of things a little bit, and let's go see if I can go to Starbucks, convince a plumber to sit down for a coffee and sell it to him for four bucks a month. So I did that, uh, and they were like, hmm, we should probably sell some more of this. Right? And so at that point, we're like, you know what? Uh, we can't quite get the Series A because our revenue is like low, uh, but let's prove it out with like a little bit more money, a little bit more time. Uh, so that's why we raised uh, kind of the Series 2, and we raised it for some, um, uh, you know, in the FFF bucket. So you know, working out. Was it, sorry to dial in there, but was it primarily previous investors or are you bringing new people in? It was all new. Okay. Yeah, the the, the first investor was eVentures. Okay. Um, and then um, and they're like, yeah. The, uh, I remember them saying like, hey, uh, just write this Christmas card to us. It'll be the last Christmas card you'll ever need to write to us. So they thought they have written us off already. Uh, and they were like, you know what? I think we got something figured out. So we raised some more money from you know the Friends Family Fools bucket, um, came in as a note um, to again then go towards the Series A. So it sounds like you guys had like um, not the most easy, clear, get to a series A path. And I think a lot of companies are like that. It never is. Yeah. Um, it sounds like a lot of tech, there's always like a lot of exceptions, but in most cases there is like a hockey stick scenario or you just fall flat on your face. Um, in this situation, when you, you said you return, uh, sorry, you cut down your burn rate really pretty aggressively and then you took a note. How was that for dealing with like warrants and everything else? And then how did that prepare you for a Series A? Because I know right now we're basically doing a down round because our first valuation was so high. And then our strategy was from all these retail guys that had retail experience, but retail is dead. And so that almost killed us. So now we're like, okay, do we do a note yeah. and then invest on that? Or are we, are we doing equity still? So it, it turns out that we're doing equity just because that's what our lead investor wants to do. And he's paying for it and setting the price, et cetera. But we were on the, we were like, in between doing a note or doing equity again, we weren't really sure. So what was your decision or was it more just circumstantial for doing a note? 
Uh, we did a note because it was really still the FFF round. Uh, and I would say they're probably, it's, it's easier to do it when it's at that level. Um, uh, like, a, like a real VC probably would do straight equity or if they plow in a bunch of money, but because we collected it from a couple of different places, it was just easier to wrap it under a note uh, with a crazy ratchet. We still beat the ratchet, so we didn't have to pay the ratchet. Um, but at that point, we just made the decision to get that money in the door real quick just so we just didn't die. Um, we probably could have gone indefinitely, or not indefinitely, but for a long time still at zero dollars because we were previously at Qualcomm and did okay. Um, but we didn't want to get to that point and let go of the, like the entire non-founding team. And so we just made a decision at that point to pull in some dollars through the convertible note because we knew that, you know, given the channels that we had, and that was just like early days, not without trying, but it was fairly easy. So when I mentioned to you guys, you know, like you only need 100 customers without my we knew roughly what we needed to get to to then go after a Series A, given the unit economics that were super strong. Because that by that point, we had enough data to truly say like, we know exactly, well, not exactly, we never really know, but like we knew well enough to pitch with confidence what our LTV to CAC was, what our payback was, and all those components. Um, and at that point, you know, investor just sees it, I was like, well, I can double my money, you know, um, for every dollar I put in, and it's like a clear line of sight um, in the in the worst case scenario uh, within all the potential upside. So that's kind of where we find ourselves at. So um, to talk about the bullets, um, you, you've noted uh, some great channels and how you kind of went wide and then started to go deep. I'm curious to know, um, maybe hear a little bit more about some of the channels that weren't working and kind of the process to figure that out. I'm, I'm sure data played a role in that, but like figuring out you know how much, how far you go into like finally realizing it, or is it cut it immediately based on compared to other channels, or just the methodology around figuring out the bad bullets? Sure. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, it's just figuring out what the bad bullets are, because really your enemy is more time, uh, right, to where you have zero zero money. Uh, so I would say start there first, and then along the way for us, you know, even today, you know, looking at like AdWords and um, like PPC, Google Display, like all that. It's just a tough channel to make it really work. The reason why is because there's all the the lead purchasers because they essentially uh, do the same advertising and sell it four ways. And so now you're competing against um, essentially someone that can spend 4X, which you can. So there's channels like that that in the beginning were like, oh, yeah, it's so easy. Let's just put a an AdWord campaign that says field service management for plumbers. Well, A, we learned plumbers don't know what field service management is. <laughs> and then in the, in the search volume is low. But then B also is ridiculously expensive because he's legion. So sometimes you got to play with incumbents for a while um, because we're not able to, to beat them. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question. But in the beginning stage, it was more about just vetting what's a waste of time, period, because that's the most crucial thing to you as a, as a young startup. Um, and then later on, you really want to start looking at what the actual economics are of things. Because now that I've got an analytics team in place and I've got someone that runs all the ad spend, <laughs> and now I've got more resources to really like spend all day long just adjusting PPC rates and all that, now we can make it work. But in the early days, like I would have been dead if I was doing that all day. There's no way. There's way more better low-hanging fruit that's out there. I guarantee it. You just got to put your thinking cap on <laughs> and think about it. Quick question on Series A round again. How did you know what are the benchmark that you need to hit before you are going to go and start pitching again for Series A? Uh, second question, did eVentures come back as a lead, or did you first look at other options before you went back to eVentures again? Well, uh, we found out roughly what we needed to go do or have in terms of revenue from eVentures because they were obviously on the board. Uh, but then when we went back, they're like, nah. So we just found somebody else. Right, so it's kiss a lot of frogs, maybe one turns into a prince kind of a thing. And so we went out and we just, we learned what wasn't working. And, um, you know, the time that we spent raising money, uh, we kept like crushing it. And so every single month we go back and the, I forget who said it, but you know, it's lines, not dots. I forget who said that one. Anyways, if you haven't heard it, essentially give investors some data points to play with. So when you come knocking on the door just a couple months later, they're like, oh crap, maybe we got to see it. Because I guarantee you, uh, like an associate level or just like an analyst level would be like, Hey guys, they said they were here like a month ago and now three months later, they're still raising and look at where they're crushing their numbers. We should have another meeting with them, right? So get in their ears early uh, and just realize like you're not maybe going to get the perfect round to collapse in like three weeks or whatever they're teaching you guys nowadays, um, right? It, it might be three months. Uh, it might be a little bit longer and it's okay. Just keep it out there. Um, and then luckily, you know, our CEO is more product focused. He's, he's not uh, a CEO that can just... 
um, you know, light up the whole room and convince investors to give a whole bunch of money, a whole bunch of nothing. It's just the product is super slick, which made us crush it, get the real numbers, and then go back out and pitch again. So before you know, uh, like, at what point do you got to go out and raise a Series A? You know, just go out there and put some feelers out there and say, hmm, what do you guys think? And if you're getting like a lot of true negative sentiment and like you really need a lot more, then just chill out. Like get three months more worth of data, then come back, knock on the door. Because it's never like, no, it's always not yet. Like every investor will hear you back again, unless they specifically do not have a focus in your area or have like a thesis or someone that would join you on a thesis. So our, our business is in B2B sales and, and specifically with brands. And I was curious if you have any experience of how to sort of approach that marketplace. So you've got a product and you're selling it to big brands to help them to do sales. Like tell me a little bit more about your um, product. So small brands, medium and big, and we're starting with small and medium right now, but the idea is that we empower them to create action campaigns mm -hmm. um, so as a way to sort of acquire customers and spark community. Sure, and so your question is like, how would I tackle that from a channel perspective? Yeah, exactly. Well, so I'd start to look at them and just, I do exactly what I did is like reverse engineer. So like, okay, so if I was that small brand and if I was that marketing manager, what would my day look like? Or I don't know who your, who your uh, person that you're targeting is, but like what literally would my day look like and how would it compress either some time that I have or some costs that I have? And so on those two fronts, figure out, okay, now where does that person spend their time? Like, where, where are they? What do they do? And just intersect it. Uh, in the worst case scenario, I just love cold calling. Everyone probably is like, oh, I don't want to cold call. Like, or I'm not good on the phone. You don't have to be good on the phone. You just have to be a passionate founder and anyone will listen to you. So what I would do is just... I would just ask for advice. That's the easiest way. Everyone loves to give advice. So go find your target audience and say, hey, I'm a startup founder. I'm looking for some advice. Do you got 20 minutes for me? But all you got to do is do a little jujitsu and then just like turn it into a pitch. Um, but everyone loves to give advice. So get them on the phone and then start to figure out like, hey, um, are there any blogs that you're reading? Um, who else do you buy from? Are, are there any other software products? So I would start to look like, hey, are there any other tools in your tool chest that you're using? And figure out if you can partner with them and do some JV style partnership. So I would just always flip my hat back on and, and like, hey, if I was that person, what would I be doing? What would be valuable? What am I already using? What am I already buying? And then figure out how you can build by our partner on, on all those fronts. Thank you. I think I might have the last one. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about measuring brand awareness, because I feel like it's this ethereal thing people like to speak to, and I think sometimes you think you have it, but how do you actually like capture that? Um, so we're still at the size where we don't measure it, uh, but we see it anecdotally, and the way that we see it is just, um, just evangelism with our current set of pros, because if you're truly good at brand awareness, then people are talking about your product, like of all the things, right? You can buy brand awareness, right? By buying a bunch of billboards and all these things. But like the best way and the cheapest way is to get pros to talk about it in our case. So when we take a look at all the Facebook groups, uh, when someone goes, hey, can you guys recommend me an invoice app? And when you start to see those threads change from like the old crufty stuff, which was like Google Calendar and like QuickBooks and Square, right? And you start seeing that and all of a sudden you see like House Call Pro and House Call Pro and it starts to pop up. You're like, hmm, okay, we're starting to get some brand awareness. Some of that has to do with like the size of the market and what percentage of it you have. But from there, if you wanted to do it, uh, what I would suggest is pay, pay one of your customers to ask that question in a forum or a group or an offline event, whatever it is. So they're like seeding the question and then just see what pops up and then do that measurement one month and see what percentage and then do another measurement the next month and another measurement the next month and see if it's increasing or decreasing. It's not like precise, but it gives you a direction because all you really need is a, is a direction. I would say don't measure brand awareness though when you're a young startup because you don't have much of it. I would try to measure things that are concretely at the bottom part of your funnel. Yeah, that's good. I was just curious as to if you would ever, um, you know, talk to investors about that or whatever. Not we really. still don't. Yeah. Yeah. So what, congrats on the success, by the way. What could kill your business and what defensibility, what kind of more do you build today to defense your business, for, build defensibility against your whatever could kill you? Um, we're at the point of not being able to be killed, <laughs> luckily, in the early days, possibly, because we maybe run out of money. But from a defensibility standpoint, I guess if, I don't know, 
Trump did something crazy and then people start stop spending any money on their homes, you know, because like money's super tight. I don't know. Like it'd have to be some crazy macro economic thing that we couldn't affect anyways. And more people would be, you know, in a, in a bad place than just us. But from a defensibility um, perspective is more than just a software we've built, we've built a whole community around it. So you can literally, um, I don't know, maybe in SF here, you'll see trucks. They'll have like Powered by House Call Pro. Uh, we have like a mastermind event, which is just a fancy word for saying a user conference. We're doing eight of those this year all across the country. And we're doing 300 pro to pro meetups, which is just like beer and one hour of just talking shop. Uh, and so from a defensibility standpoint, more than just because someone could go build our software and reverse engineer it or just build it because it's pretty simple. Well, it's not pretty simple. It just takes time and money. But uh, the community, which is like kind of the bro brotherhood or sisterhood of uh, connecting with pros that are like-minded like you, we offer that as part of joining House Call Pro in an exclusive Facebook group. You have to be enrolled to be a part of it. And I participate a lot in there still personally. So people feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one connection. And if they have ideas or feedback, you give it. So I think for any business, if you're looking at it, building that community, uh, and those evangelists is really huge from a defensibility. Because once someone promotes your product and says, yes, pick House Call Pro, it's better than all these other guys guys and it's out there it's very low likelihood that they're going to go out and be like mm, you know what nope let's go pick this one because guess who looks like an idiot the guy did it in the first place <laughs> Yeah, Service Titan. So the way that uh, so Service Titan is a really good company in this space as well. The way that I see Service Titan is um, you're familiar with Dropbox and Box. You know they both sell cloud storage, right? Well, one's enterprise and one's prosumer, right? So there are just completely different price points. So when you take a look at our market, you look at 20 trucks and up. It's more like Box. It's enterprise. It's big. And then from us, from a defensibility standpoint, is our unit economics are so good nobody can even come into our area period. Um, and part of that's just driven by product because our product is so simple. It's really easy to build a complex product that's got all kinds of bells and whistles um, and is impossible to learn. And you try to tell a plumber that they'll get it up and running in six months, they'll walk the other direction. Great, thank you so much, Roland, that was great.